While everything is set up, uh, I can make some um, entertainment here in the beginning to make it not so boring for those who had their nap. Um, welcome to the GSOC panel. Um, GSOC is one of the great pillars of open source in general, and it's a great thing that uh, Google sponsors all the development and many features that we have in LibreOffice are developed by students from all over the world, which is absolute a great thing. We are totally happy with this. Sometimes we have students who come uh, later into the project, not sometimes, quite often actually, many students who uh, do a Google Summer of Code work come later into the project and uh, become an um, expert. So, Doing this uh, Google Summer of Code work is not only interesting for the student or the community, also for the project. So it is a great thing and it's a good tradition to have at the LibreOffice conference a panel about what has been done. So first of all, we had uh, four admins this year. Four admins sounds like a hell of a work. It was uh, actually not so much. Uh, Moggy did all the work in the uh, initial preparing, and later it was uh, Torsten who did, uh, who managed um, most of the process. Cisco was punishing everything, <laughs> and me and Heiko. So we are the four um, admins in the project, and we had six students. Uh, incidentally, um, is Bonfjaga here, per chance, or is he having a talk? Because he was the. The, well, missing, the missing admin. Yeah, um, he's not here. I think he is in Australia somewhere. Far away. Um, we had six projects this year. All of the project passed uh, both evaluations, so it was a great success. And we are happy to uh, have, hopefully, many of the students here. I'm, I'm not aware who of the students is missing. I believe not everyone of the students is here. And that means the mentors will have the presentation, and even if the mentor is not willing to uh, present the topic, it will be one of us admins. So That's what we so plan. Do we have, do we have uh, someone for Shupam Goyal for the QR code? Do we have someone for Rasmus? Yes. Do we have someone for Sumit for the notebook bar? Do we have someone for Ahmed? Excellent. And for Kaishu? Candy, excellent. And um, while well, we're missing slides for uh, the chart style thing, do we per chance have the mentor here who can then spontaneously demo that on stage? That's a shame. Okay, so that's maybe also the reason there are some slides. Um, right, so maybe before we start. Um, so GSOC is actually, um, as um, Heiko so aptly said, um, uh, quite important for the project. There's always, so there's always a, a specific area, like kind of class of feature or, or implementation that is usually only happening during GSOC. Um, and um, it's a great way to introduce students to the project in open source. It's been, it's, uh, it's the 14th year, so it uh, has the 15 years anniversary uh, next year. Um, so founded in 2005, it's now pretty large. It's about, I think, 1,300 to 1,500 students every year that get sponsored by, by Google to work on open source for three months. Um, of course, all of that would not be possible without the mentors, so we have that in the end, but let me just give a big shout out uh, to all the mentors spending in um, their time and energy. And um, I'm, I'm a bit sad that this year actually we, we didn't manage to get uh, not a single one um, of the students here for any kind of reasons, a number of reasons. Some of them were just far away or had other plans. Some of them had to cancel for personal reasons. So um, this year, for the first time, I think um, we will only have the mentors 
uh, presenting, so we will see that we will uh, do that better for the next time because it's also would have been a great opportunity, of course, to get to know each other um, like you. Uh, get to know the students and the students get to know you and bond and then um, have fun with each other during the conference. But that's how life is um, this time. Okay. Should we get uh, all the mentors here on stage before we start so that there's a smooth handover? Can I ask all the mentors on stage, please? <laughs> And we, we already have a few mentors on stage, so no. <laughs> thanks. Not really. So, 50 minutes? So, yeah, I think we have, I think. We have plenty of time. Um, yeah, but so. uh, it gets bit boring and uh, it's not so much prepared. If the time exceeds 50 minutes, I would stop it. Very well. Then let me hurry up. Hurry up. <laughs> so first in the line, um, uh, I was uh, co-mentoring with uh, Björn um, the LibreSign project, LibreOffice on Appliances. Um, who knows digital signage as a, as a concept? Right, so that's like all over the place. That's, you don't have billboards these days. Uh, you just have like large displays driven by some embedded device say, uh, showing some, some advertising or some movies or the weather. Um, and we, we thought it would be great to have LibreOffice running on those uh, pieces because they can perfectly run them, like on a Raspberry Pi, for example. Uh, and then being able, like an admin can then upload there some content and it would be running in an endless loop or on a conference like this, uh, or in FOSTEM, there could be Raspberry Pi, uh, where you can just go upload your slides there and then run the slideshow from your mobile phone um, uh, in a local Wi-Fi network. So that was the, the, the broad idea behind that. Um, so as the slide just um, tells you again, um, so that was kind of, um, we kind of tweaked the plan and came up with new ideas as we were going because um, once we got the first thing there, we, got, uh, we thought, oh, it would be really great if, you, if we would be able to then have this impress remote style um, way to control the presentation from, from, your, uh, from your second device or from your mobile phone. So the, 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 the initial idea was just to have a Raspberry Pi running a server and displaying on the screen the host name or the IP address and the port. So you can just put your, this URL into your phone, connect with that uh, device on, on that server, upload your content, like kind of choose a playlist, sort some orders, I don't know, do some settings there, and then you press the button and it will play that. Um, but then again, as we had this running, we, we thought it would be really great for this, like, we, had, we always had this FOSTEM uh, set up in mind with lots of people coming in and uh, presenting and always this problem with the, with the connectors uh, and uh, the display's not really working and the aspect ratio not really right. So, um, and then the Impress remote was kind of broken, so we thought, oh, we can do that as a JavaScript application in the browser. So it was kind of evolving. Um, General structure, um, three parts. Main program is a um, um, LibreSign Python package available from PyPy, um, which starts LibreOffice um, in the background and a web server. And then you can upload your ODP files there, and uh, LibreOffice will be controlled by Uno, by remote Uno loads the file, gets the uh, the virtual play button uh, pressed and then comes the slideshow and it repeats or it gets the next slide, uh, the next ODP file loaded and so on. Um, that's uh, JavaScript, single page application, so we can do that all um, in, uh, in one place. And it's accessible on a local network, on a, on a custom port. Um, so you can, of course, put some reverse proxy in front of that if you want to harden that, but it's essentially Flask-based 
very, very simple REST-based API with a web server that ships you some JavaScript in the browser that controls that. That's how it looks. So upload presentation, change the order, play that in conference mode or in signage mode, um, remove things. And um, then comes when you start that, you get this web-based impress remote, which is another single page application, which, which is a separate uh, repository. Um, there's three repositories there. Uh, has slide previews and notes like the real thing. It's not quite as polished as the Android thing, but on the other hand, it works. Um, just by, uh, in contrast to the an, uh, Android application. And it's, um, it gets started from the control panel, and that's how it looks. So you got those thumbnails there, so you can select that. You can skip to the end, to the beginning, put it on, on autoplay, for example. Um, quite a bit of polishing that would still be needed. I suspect if somebody want to, wants to productize that, um, but it's, most of that is really easy hacks, so that, like the big picture things, that's all in place and works. Um, clearly some optimizations, some stuff is really not perfect yet. For example, those slide thumbnails are a bit slow to load for large slide decks. All of that is ready, um, packaged on PyPy, um, and works mostly out of the box. Okay, what's that in time? You have 12 minutes left. How much did you Entertain say? Entertain us. How much did you say? I didn't you say five minutes? 15. Oh, 15. That's what a, good. what a, a pity long. that you uh, didn't set up a prototype here for these yeah, couple of presentations. I, I brought a Raspberry Pi and then I realized I didn't bring a keyboard. Uh, and then I had lots of slides to, uh, to write and, and the student wasn't there. <laughs> so, but I had all the best intentions. But maybe for, for Fostem we get something and then can run the deaf room from that. That would be, that would be really nice. Um, so any questions so to Thorsten to forward to Rasmus? If not, let's continue. I'm sure there's questions. There must be some. Should I suggest some questions to ask? Heiko, you have a question. I ask questions. Why did you? No. Get great UI. <laughs> yes, we did that. <laughs> um, so, so maybe some show of hands. So who, who thinks this could be useful? Yeah. So I, I really, and, and those Fostum guys, they have this, this little boxes with, the, with this uh, HDMI splitter and the recording equipment there, and they're already having some, some embedded hardware they're running, or, some, or maybe it's some, some Atom, but kind of smallish, uh, underpowered thing, and that already uh, handles display uh, and, and video signals, so it's probably just getting that into that distribution to be able to run that, and, and Wi-Fi is pretty good there. So, and with the uh, latest Raspberry Pi versions, you got on board Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So in theory, you could perhaps even get the the Impress Remote original version working. We were just not not up to that. Okay, so if there's no questions, let's not dwell on that. Um, next project that um, I was nominally co-mentoring, um, but it was uh, largely Samuel there doing the work. Um, that's QR code generator. So there's um, the feature in other applications that um, lets you easily um, embed a QR code in, in your document. Um, it's something as a special special field. Um, and uh, Shupam grabbed that and um, got it to completion. Um, and it's essentially using a third party uh, library that generates a QR code, um, shows some dialog box where you put the necessary information and then sticks that um, into the document as a shape. Um, and it's even round tripping that, so when you reload that, then you can uh, open it again and edit the properties, um, save it again, round trip it again. Uh, QR code itself is SVG, so that's um, also nice when you print that. <coughs> 
Yeah, and it even works with all XML. Oh, look at that. Um, that's how it looks. So pretty simple, um, very basic, but I think quite useful these days. Like um, I see that uh, on on many like letters from the bank, letters from the insurance that you get some little QR code there, so that I can when you when you fill the form and send it back, I can s scan that and then kind of associate that with you again without any handwriting OCR. So I suspect that's um, very useful to have. And it's um, it's in 6.3, more or less. What is it? At least, at least it's in master. But mm -hmm. I believe uh, 6.3 has it um, included. What I remember is um, um, yeah, complaints to move the access from a very prominent position and um, edit, insert, insert QR code, so it's a root, towards uh, some uh, place where it does not take that much space from the menu. That means people are looking at it. They're not only master 631. Six, I'm not. You can check with that person. Yeah. 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 Say again? His computer is uh, running 63. So, yeah, switch back. But I. Uh, yeah, okay, let's. Uh, okay. Insert takes. Insert. It has a Spanish UI. Um, challenged. What now? <laughs> I don't see it there. Okay, so let's assume it's not in 63, so I'm off the hook. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I stand corrected. So it's it's uh, it's going to be in six four then. So it's right now only in master. Okay. So that, that was the the um, the trigger for that. Um, this kind of oldish bug there. Um, um, and the work was like kind of all over the code base, like it was touching UI, it was touching the filters. Um, so all in all, I think it was a, quite a nice project for getting into, into LibreOffice development. Um, had all the pieces there. And um, yeah, came to a conclusion. And uh, Shubham is also plans to continue contributing, which is, um, which is also nice. Um, chart wizard work, um, some bug fixing here and there, and some open uh, to-do items from the um, um, from from that project. And let's see, maybe we meet him at Fostum or at one of the next Hackfests. Exactly. Any questions? So maybe a question to the people. Um, the dialogue looks right now a little bit boring. It works perfectly. It is actually the same as an Inkscape. You create a QR code and you get it. You get what you want. But it does not look like uh, the usual feature it is of a LibreOffice. So what can we add to the QR code to, um, to enhance this? Any ideas? I believe um, since it's an SVG, you can change the color. Animations, the waving QR code. Animations. Waving QR codes. Yeah, images in the center of the QR code, for example. Mm -hmm. Which actually works. Uh, there's this, um, so you can have some, I don't know how that works, but I've seen that. Uh, like. At least you can uh, overlay the QR code over something. What I had in mind is some 3D QR code for G4, 4D, whatever fancy stuff. If you have an idea, I believe what was Shubham? Uh, I forgot his name. Oh, sorry. Um, is uh, happy to continue the work. 
And it's one of those, when, when you look at it, you think like, yeah, but do you really need that? It's one of those really nice, tiny features that are extremely useful when you need them. Uh, and when they even work, like with this round tripping, when they work nicely uh, and have, have nice user experience, then it's a bit like, like, I mean, I'm reminded of the PDF export back in the day where the, where the initial reaction of the people was, what do we need that? We just print that and then uh, PS to PDF convert that. And what do we need this uh, kind of extra bloat, extra functionality inside LibreOffice? And over the time, it became a standard feature um, for Office application. And that's kind of, this, I mean, it's, it's not on the scale, but it's a very nice round extra feature. So. So you want to, so uh, Tor is asking um, if we can reduce something or make it easier and the question. Um, I don't know. So, so, so the the question was, um, why would you not uh, have error correction or like a default error correction? Uh, answer from Cloth is like probably it effect, affects the size of the QR code, like more error correction, bigger, more pixel. I don't know. Yeah, but this is all about choice. This is not. This is not. This is not Apple. Uh, I'm just. I'm just interested. Uh, how this is implemented? This is like uh, treated like SVG with extra properties uh, inside the document. Yeah, it has some custom properties. So it's in, it's it's like a shape with a with an SVG image and some extra properties. I have to admit, I don't know the exact, I haven't seen like um, the filter code. I just, well, I was following when, when there was the third party library work, integration work. But that should be easy. I mean, it's less, uh, look for Shupam as author and you will find the change in, in XML of. Um. Suggestion. Uh, the engineer in me wants to say, great, but um, there is room to put the border units. So we can make that huge area a little bit smaller and maybe just add the unit so that the user would know is it one pixel, one meter, one kilo, one person. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, sure, Thank you. I'm sure Shupam would be most most thrilled to, to uh, receive your bug report, your enhancement request. Okay, so with that, I need to run for the next meeting, which is conflicting with this one. <laughs> Should we move to Sumit? Hello, my name is Shimon Kwas and I was mentoring Summit, uh, who was working on uh, improvements to the notebook bar. Uh, uh, we, this project had two, uh, two parts. Uh, first thing to do was uh, the customization. Uh, we wanted something simple, so we decided to add only a show and hide possibility uh, because we wanted to finish this in, in the short summer and later uh, with existing framework for uh, modifications, uh, we, can, we can create some easy hack uh, to, to add possibility to, for example, change the uh, UNO command. Uh, second part was extension support. Uh, and in the customization uh, case, Summit 
extended the existing dialog. You can find it under uh, menu in classic uh, toolbars under tools customize on in different implementations uh, it is placed in menu on the right side uh, he added new tab to this dialog and as you can see you can uh, choose here scope which means uh, implementation uh, because we can have uh, multi multiple ty types of notebook bar for each application and the second second list box is the target where you can specify if you want to modify, for example, home tab or uh, some of these uh, sections inside. And there is a list of items. You can just click and show or, or hide this item. Uh, this, this was done by uh, copying the original UI file of notebook bar to the user's home directory and saving the modification list to registry. Uh, thanks to that, we can regenerate this, the same modification after LibreOffice update when, for example, designer decides to remove or add some items. Uh, but uh, this, this is only one detail to uh, finish. We, uh, we need to add this uh, trigger after uh, we detect updated LibreOffice because now it's only uh, generated on, on modification in the customization di dialog or on the first run. Uh, this solution with uh, copying UI files is uh, we decided to use th that kind of uh, solution because we don't want to, to waste the time to parse the uh, widgets uh, on each run of, of uh, LibreOffice. Uh, the second uh, sub-project was extension support. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is additional extension tab uh, where New items are added by extensions in the same way like in classic toolbars. Uh, extension developer needs to add special XML file into the extension code where he specify where, uh, which commands are added. Uh, it's, not, it's very similar to old uh, XML file for, for, for toolbars, so it's not a big problem to uh, convert existing uh, ad extensions to to support Notebook Bar. I think we can even prepare a script to to convert extensions, which which have uh, some some items in in the toolbar. Uh, for now, it, it's uh, some kind of a temporary solution that we created. Uh, new modification in VCL Builder, but uh, we are going to, to move the code to some separate widget for, for this uh, extension uh, code. And other thing to do is to put the uh, extension code for, for all implementation because now it's only in writer, in tapped implementation. And uh, Summit is uh, still contributing to the project. He actively uh, does some changes uh, in the code during, even during the conference. So uh, we still are improving the notebook bar. Uh, any questions? Thanks a lot. I believe it was the, the project with the most communication. It was on Telegram, and I just glanced over it. Uh, millions of messages went up and down, and uh, Simon was continuously uh, mentoring, and uh, the people were uh, talking about it. So um, it was amazing work. The questions. In the end, did the customization 
um, feature get implemented, did it? And in the end, did it get implemented by saving the customized .ui file into the configuration? Uh, no, we copy the original UI file into the user home directory, and we modify this UI file uh, depending on the configuration in the registry. So in the registry, we have only the list of IDs which were modified, and we, we apply this to the UI file. So we add only property uh, visible true or false for yeah. now. So if, for example, um, a lot of those uh, UI files in the, um, in the muffin or the top bar have custom widgets, so does it copy the UI file so that it has copy, it still references those custom widget um, names? My, my point being that if in a later version somebody removes one of those custom widgets, will there still be a reference to a custom widget in people's customized versions? Uh, like, are you stuck forever supporting custom widgets that you might want to get rid of, rename, or modify? Uh, for now, we only modify this one property about visibility, mm -hmm. so I don't see the problem because when we uh, want to regenerate the customized UI file, after some update and designer removed some, some widget, mm. then we just don't find this, this item and we ignore this, this setting. So I think there is no problem. Uh, you said you um, apl apply the configuration based on the IDs of the UI files. What happens if IDs are shuffled around or removed or a different element gets the same ID in the future? If uh, another item has the same ID, I think uh, UI file will be not rendered, so we will not create anything. I, I think we, we had sometimes uh, during development the problem that uh, nothing was inside the notebook bar, and the reason was uh, two items were with the same ID. So probably it's uh, somewhere in VCL, uh, and th this is not nothing. <laughs> but that can't be prevented. So if anyone edits a UI dialog and, and or any the, the positions and, and changes the IDs, and, and uh, if that doesn't match anymore. But these changes are added by developers and should be tested because... No, you have to do the work twice then, if you have to adapt something. Uh, could you repeat? If you have to adapt something because you match the IDs somehow and it's stored in the, in the user ID, the developer can't do anything about it. Uh, I don't... Uh, I don't... Uh, or maybe I don't misunderstood. I don't know, but I'm, I'm not sure. For now, we don't modify the structure. Uh, oh. We can only set property for each small button to visibility, true or false. There is no, no problem with changing anything, positions or something, no, because but, we but don't modify this. But you remember the properties by the IDs of the UI dialog, so, so that the, 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 the properties uh, are saved by the ID in the user configuration. For, for right? now, it's n the dot .ui, it's not loaded into any data model, but it's uh, processed as XML file. So... I'm not sure I understood that then. Maybe I just met a misunderstood. I don't um, know. <laughs> maybe I, I don't understand too. Maybe Miklos can help here. Um, as I understand it, and please, Shimon, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the idea is that uh, in case there is a version update, then they again take the original UI file, which might have some custom widgets removed, some widgets renamed, whatever, and based on the configuration, 
uh, they again kind of patch the UI file, just the visibility boolean to true or false. So in case the widget ID is, for example, renamed, then you use your, your custom hidden state, but that's the end of it. No positions messed up or no segmentation for just because some custom widget would be loaded and it's no longer there or anything like that. So yes. while uh, I imagine, given infinite time, this is not the nicest solution, I guess uh, there is no huge compatibility concern here. At least that's how I understand it. Yes, yes. Uh, we use always the original file. Uh, so it means after update, the original file will be changed, and some not supported widgets are removed from that file. So when we read the uh, configuration and there is um, some uh, item modification which ex existed before and now doesn't exist, it will be not copied to the new custom file because uh, it, it is not in, in the new original one. So Maybe Cisco can help us here with a fancy UI test. It was a hand over to the next topic in case there is no other question. Thanks a lot. Yes, so this project was uh, carried out by Ahmed El Shahid from Egypt. Um, I was just a commentor and Marcus was the main mentor here, and he basically did everything. I was just uh, back up there, just in case. So if you ask me any technical question, I cannot, I'm afraid I cannot answer it. But, um, well, I can explain to you what it's it about. Uh, so, as you may know, uh, Mogi did a UI testing framework now we use it uh, uh, with, uh, in, Jenkins, in Jenkins with uh, MateCheck and also, well, we use it for other purposes as well. Uh, so this UI framework, or UI testing framework has a, a logger. So first off, I'm gonna show you that logger so then you can understand what is this about. So, yeah. Um, I have to. So, if you, as you might know, if we call LibreOffice with this uh, environment variable low underscore collect your info and then the name of a file, then <coughs> we can lock uh, the actions we do in the UI. For instance, if we insert uh, yeah, this, this is simple, but if we insert a page break and now we, go, we close LibreOffice. Um, I don't see. But, well. Okay. Gonna do it again just in case. So if I insert a page break, and now I close LibreOffice, okay? Now I'm gonna have a file here in Instead UI test, uh, and then the, now the, the name of the file. So now I can see uh, the actions I did. So first I start, started right there then this was done in the background, I guess. And then I inserted the page break, uh, where well, here more information, and then all the keyword uh, actions I did when I closed and I got the save dialog, and then finally, finally closed the dialog. <coughs> so this is how the logger for the UI testing works. So now I can continue with the, oh, sorry. 
I can continue with the presentation. So basically, the idea was that first, and Ahmed did that, extend that logger. In the past, it was more uh, trivial and not that well. Those there many uh, actions were in log, and others were in, uh, really easy to understand. So first he did that, and now many other many new actions are log, like the one when I saved the the save dialog before that before he did his project. That action was in log. So now, for instance, we have those action logs. And also, he implemented a, a, well, a, a language, a, program, a DSL a programming language to understand that um, log and then out of it create a, a UI test for the uh, UI test uh, framework. So, um, yeah, this, yeah, this is important. So this is how it works. Uh, well, we did first action. So now, and second one, close LibreOffice. So now we have the log. And now what we want to do, and it's what um, Ahmed implemented, is to convert this log into a, a test. So for that, now we have the log here. So I just go to this folder. And I call um, the interpreter, which is uh, Python 3, DSL, core, dot pi and then where the the path to the to the log and then the output which is in this case sample. So I execute it and now I have uh, yeah, I have it here and then I just Well, I can now you see it. this test uh, was created uh, out of the uh, log, and now I, if I want to execute it, uh, well, there is a script uh, that you can use for executing UA test. That is basically this one. So you just set the uh, environment variables, and then you call the, the script. Uh, so if I execute it, then now LibreOffice is inserted. Well, it's going really fast. But yeah, if you, as you can see, LibreOffice is executed, uh, right there, open, and then um, a new uh, page break is inserted. It says there is an error because uh, the actions in the uh, save dialog uh, were recorded as well. And when we executed from the UI test framework, uh, well, the, this dialog is not displayed. But then we could uh, remove that part. Uh, mm, some player. So we could remove all this safe part. And now we have the test. And well, we did it without coding anything. So just using the UI and then using, using this uh, DSL uh, interpreter. So that's that. that that's the 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 program, or well, the this this project, and that's basically it, I think. Yeah. So. Sure. Yeah.
Da, o să costim ea, da. So, why the intermediate step to convert from the log file to the Python? Why, why not just directly consume the log file inside the test itself? Uh, yeah, I cannot. I'm afraid I cannot answer that question. I think it's uh, Marco's decision to do it this way. I believe. Um, yeah, I think one of the goals of this uh, project is that, um, well, if we have, let's say, a crash or well, a, a bug that needs many steps to follow, this can be interesting. So then, um, yeah, um, no, I don't know. <laughs> I was going to ask the same, the same thing, but I have another comment. So from experience, I think you're going to hit a very interesting bug that's going to frustrate all of your test almost, which is that there is no timing between the commands. So what happens when you execute something that takes a little bit longer, but, but your script doesn't know, so your script invokes the next command, which fails because the first one isn't finished or it's in the wrong state. And so you get frustrated because every time you run these scripts on different machines with different load levels, depending on the timing, half your tests are failing, right? Because the state is not synchronized. Your script is just running at full speed, but LibreOffice is, is, it has its own um, um, pace, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on the resources it's consuming and the system. So I would strongly suggest you um, include timing uh, between the commands. So you capture not just the commands that were executed, but also the timing between them. And then what you can do is you can um, run them either at original speed or you can run them faster. And if you run them faster and it fails, you retry at the normal speed, you see? Um, and, and this way you have control over it. Otherwise, this is, I mean, it's a great idea. But if you don't time it, it's just going to give you random failures. And every time you'll spend time looking at it, and not get anywhere. Thank you. So actually, like, I don't like the idea of timing. <laughs> so uh, yeah, for, for I think test, things should be uh, like either like um, triggering some some state uh, or um, synchronized this way because like we would like to start, uh, run the tests as fast as possible. So like adding some some kind of timing it just leads to the like when it doesn't work like let's just set 10 seconds everywhere and yeah i, I don't know for sure uh, i don't know for sure in this particular case but i know in the general case the support is in there that all these things are dispatched until there is no pending events so it goes as fast as it can, and then it doesn't depend on any specific timing because of all those issues, and that's all built into the existing uh, UI tests. So they all, they all work like that anyway, so it should be all good. Any other comment? Otherwise, uh, do, we, do we have more? It's the missing slides. And uh, yeah, back to your question, Thomas. Maybe the reason why we do it now in two steps, uh, it's because, well, initially, uh, Marcus just did the logger, and now we have uh, the interpreter. Maybe at some point, we decide just to remove the step in between. So that's just the, the way it has been implemented. So because it could, maybe it wasn't done at once. So. Maybe that's the reason, but I cannot say for sure. Thank you.
Hello, hello. So I'm not Kai Shushaho, uh, I'm Kande, but Kai Shushaho was the awesome guy who did uh, this LibreOffice uh, Android app improvements. And why I say uh, he was awesome, uh, it was because like, he contacted uh, uh, the project early, he got involved into the development, sent the, uh, sent the easy hacks uh, early, and most of all, he sent the easy hacks in the relevant area. So like from the very start, even his first, uh, first easy hack that he has contributed to, to LibreOffice was actually related uh, to the LibreOffice Android improvements, uh, which is quite an achievement because I don't think that he has actually asked too much, so he has, uh, he has uh, figured out lots of that uh, uh, by himself. And it uh, like showed in the, later in the GSOC as well, uh, because like, uh, the, the communication was, uh, was very easy and straight to the point with him. Uh, like, yeah, so he provided some patch, I gave some feedback, or Quickie gave some feedback. Uh, he has adapted that. Boom, uh, work done. So uh, what he has done, uh, yeah, and uh, how it was with the Android. Uh, so you maybe have heard, some of you, that in my previous presentation, uh, so actually, like this year, uh, like we were changing where the and, uh, Android uh, application lives and how it behaves. Uh, so his initial patches were actually in the, uh, into the old Android app that lives in the core.git, uh, but the later patches and the work, uh, all the work that, uh, that is uh, actually listed there, uh, here uh, is, uh, is for the new uh, Android app. Uh, so all the stuff uh, that, uh, that he's committed is either still in the garret because uh, I was, uh, uh, I was like, uh, lagging behind and didn't integrate it yet, or uh, it is already there and it is being used. So for example, the print support, uh, slideshow support, import image into the document, this is all integrated stuff. Shared document, it is still in garret, but uh, I just need to test it like somehow more uh, before it, uh, I integrate it, but uh, like from the patch point of view, of code reading point of view, it all looks fine as it should. Uh, safe as document, I think it is in. Rash, uh, rational dialog for permissions, that's in. Work done. Uh, Large shortcuts, uh, uh, that's in. Uh, this uh, support other formats, it is still in Garrett. Dimming the document when inactive uh, was integrated a few days ago. So. Uh, lots of good stuff, but not only that, like these are the new features that he has done over the summer for the, for the new Android app, uh, but he has also provided uh, like, uh, quite a lot of uh, minor changes and bug fixes. Uh, so again, like you, can, uh, you can read it here. Uh, something that I should... Yeah, uh, cut, copy, and pay support. That's, that's quite important. And uh, yeah, otherwise, you see lots of great stuff from him. So yeah, uh, it's a shame that he cannot be here. It would be awesome to have him, uh, have him here and uh, buy him some, some drink of his choice. So yeah, that's Kai Shu Sahu. Anything you want to know about Android? There is a question. Yes, uh, why is this dimming when inactive needed? Doesn't the display or the device go to sleep automatically when inactive anyway? Sorry? Uh, why is this dimming, dimming needed? Dimming? Doesn't, doesn't yes. the whole display go to sleep when Yes, inactive? Uh, because uh, I actually hate it on my phone, like when there is an app uh, that doesn't dim itself or you know, in the recent Android versions, uh, like for example, I have a map application uh, that, uh, from some reason, when I just uh, like uh, uh, press the uh, press the button for power, so that like it dims the screen, uh, it is in some kind of mode that like only just pressing it again uh, unlocks the phone and directly like you you see it. So with this application, it uh, very happen, happen uh, hap very often happens to me that like you press the power button, uh, you expect like uh, the device is uh, is just sleeping. Uh, I put it to to my uh, to my uh, pocket, 
and at some stage uh, I feel the heat of the phone uh, that it actually like auto turned on and uh, the uh, the app uh, went into some some busy loop and uh, and uh, was just uh, just eating my power. So uh, so like what is done with this dimming is that uh, that actually like Android has uh, has some timeout uh, after which uh, like it uh, dims and uh, locks the phone, and uh, so like. Uh, the the online itself just uh, just has the countdown uh, for uh, like uh, after which it uh, like is supposed to dim and so uh, like when the when the timeout in the online goes uh, to zero or um, you know after uh, half a uh, half a minute or minute or I don't know how is it configured uh, then like we turn on uh, this auto dimming feature in the uh, in Android and so it dims the screen uh, when you then try to unlock the device like you have to uh, you uh, like when you touch power of, uh, of the device you have to unlock it uh, and uh, so it is really saving the power and uh, you cannot get to the situation that it just unlocks itself and and ease the power so So that was the motivation, M my pet PV, you know, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions? Then thank you and Kaishu. Now it was, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, this was the last available slide. So it has ended. Many thanks to Google. Definitely many thanks to the mentors. It was a great year. And after GSOG is before GSOG. So let's uh, start now with finding topics for the next year, finding students that are capable that can start with uh, easy hacks now. So looking forward for the next year. Thanks a lot.